uh, for a nice introduction. I'm very humbled to be able to present our work. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a joint work with uh, two co-authors, uh, Alexander Turin, who is a postdoc at uh, uh, KAUS in Saudi Arabia in uh, Optimization Machine Learning Lab. Uh, and uh, Peter Richtarik, who is the director of the uh, lab and is also known as uh, the co-inventor of federated learning. And uh, our work is uh, in the area of non-convex stochastic distributed optimization, where we build upon um, the established um, state-of-the-art method uh, called MARINA. And uh, what we did is we applied, uh, we have invented uh, a new compression mechanism that applied to, new, uh, to, to Marina uh, improves its uh, performance significantly and thus establishes a new state-of-the-art um, convergence rate. So uh, we are happy, very happy to uh, announce as well that uh, the paper uh, was recently accepted at the ICLR uh, 2022 conference. Uh, so, but before I move on to the details, I prepared some maybe mini refresher tutorial uh, on distributed uh, optimization. So this is probably the slide you have seen a bazillion of times. So we, we minimize the average of functions and uh, we assume that these functions are lower bounded. Uh, their Hessian is Lipschitz continuous. So we say that it's L minus smooth. This L minus is our notation. Uh, that will come clear later uh, because we will we will introduce some more constants that are kind of related. So we wanted to distinguish them, but this is not, not to, to say nothing more than just uh, Lipschitz. Uh, the gradient is Lipschitz continuous. Uh, there is less standard assumption that we make in the paper, which is that uh, the second moment of uh, the smoothness terms, if you will is uh, upper bounded by this constant squared times x minus y squared. So this is not a standard assumption done in optimization papers, but uh, an attentive listener will notice that uh, if we uh, assume that each fi is li smooth, then we can take, then the, the, this assumption holds with l plus equals to one over l times l, uh, one over n times li squared, because we can unbound each of these terms separately and we will get this. So in fact, this assumption is weaker than this assumption. And this assumption is very standard in the optimization papers. Okay. And we solved the, we try to solve this problem usually through stochastic gradient descent. So we produce a random iterates uh, through this process. So XK is the current iterate, gamma is the step size, and the GK is some unbiased uh, estimator of the gradient at point XK. But of course, uh, there are some problems. Uh, and the problem is that uh, the, uh, uh, the function that we want to minimize can be non-convex and minimizing non-convex functions is NP hard and in particular, gradient descent does not solve it. So we uh, resort to minimizing the norm of the gradient. So if we try to find the extreme point. Uh, and uh, of course, this have some, has some further issues. For example, the method can converge to saddle points and we ideally want to find the local uh, minimum. Uh, this can be remedied, but it will not be, it's beyond the scope of this talk. So uh, what we do is we produce a, we want to produce a random iter at xt for which uh, the expectation of the norm of the gradient at xt is less than or equal to epsilon. Uh, and what is distributed gradient descent? So what we do is the following. So we have uh, n nodes, uh, called workers, and each of them stores a function. Uh, and then there is a master node, which uh, oversees the whole procedure and all the devices together and cooperate to solve the problem that I've just described. And what happens is this. At each, at each iteration, uh, the, uh, let's say we, have, we are at a point xk, the nodes compute the gradient um, at uh, at, at xk uh, of each local function, and then they send it to the worker. Uh, the worker then aggregates the gradients by averaging them, uh, and sends them and sends them back, uh, and the process continues. 
However, uh, this is a difficulty because, okay, why we did that? We did that because we want to save on computation. Uh, in this setting, each device computes only one gradient per iteration, so that's cheap. But we are running into another bottleneck, which is that the communication is expensive. Uh, if we want to, if the data is highly dimensional, then uh, then it's very difficult to communicate the gradient. So there is a bit of a trade-off here, um, and this is something we need to address. And we address it by compressing the gradients. Uh, so what we do is we have some uh, we predefine uh, some randomized mappings CI, and we apply it to the gradient. We apply them to the gradient uh, before uh, communicating them to the master node. So then the master node aggregates them uh, and uh, sends, the, uh, sends the gradient estimates to the workers and the process continues. So this is the actual SGD. Um, right, so uh, of course, uh, if we uh, compress the gradients, then we have only partial information about the gradients. So, we, uh, so, so the number of, let's say, communication rounds has to be uh, bigger, has to increase, like in the usual SGD. Uh, however, we save on communication. So uh, the question is, how do we balance these things out? And the answer is uh, a quantity called uh, communication complexity. And we define it as the number of uh, communication rounds or iterations, if you will, uh, and multiplying it by uh, the, the expected number of bits sent by each worker. And so, so we assume that the uh, slowest worker is the bottleneck and everything happens in parallel. So what's really important is how many times we send the gradients and how, much, how many bits do we send, does each worker send in one iteration? Okay, so are there any questions at this point? No, I think that's fine. You can All right, continue. I will continue then. Uh, okay, so here are the standard assumptions because I have given like a generic uh, uh, just compressors. I didn't know, I didn't tell anything about these uh, operators. So here are the most uh, typical assumptions that are uh, that are um, made uh, for these compressors. So uh, we assume that they are unbiased, and we assume that they satisfy this inequality. So the norm of the uh, uh, of this difference or variance actually is upper bounded by some constant times the norm of a squared. Uh, some optimization papers uh, make this assumption uh, that they remove this term and it's some constant. Uh, but uh, this is often like this. This often doesn't hold. Uh, uh, I, I think I think these papers also make stronger assumptions about the gradient, like for example the fact that it's bounded. We don't make such assumption. If we make this assumption, then it actually very often holds and it's very reasonable. Uh, okay, so uh, and uh, oftentimes, and this is like uh, the key uh, point, uh, we assume that these compressors are independent. However, and I will explore this later, the, one of the main contributions of our paper is that uh, we, uh, uh, we as, as far as we know, introduced the first uh, compression operators that are not independent, they are correlated, and they, have, they attain uh, state-of-the-art uh, convergence guarantees. Uh, right, so here are the, some examples. I will, uh, I'm not sure if I will uh, discuss them in detail due to time constraints, but I will discuss them in uh, maybe general terms. So, uh, I, so far I've just given you names, but essentially we distinguish uh, two uh, compressor, uh, two types of compressor operators, uh, because again, what's what's the purpose of these operators? Well, the purpose is that we want to make the gradients small in terms of the size or bits that uh, are necessary to encode them. So we can do it in a number of ways. For example, uh, we can uh, choose some uh, subsets of coordinates that we want to preserve in a gradient and zero out the others. Uh, then uh, this, uh, this type of um, kind of uh, compression is called a sparsification. Uh, and so we make the vector sparse. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the sparsification operators that uh, the example are here are rand k, top k and perm k. Perm k is our uh, contribution. This is, this is a new operator that I will discuss later. Um, and then there is a quantization. 
uh, which uh, doesn't make the vector sparse, but it uh, it makes the uh, entries of the vector smaller smaller. So, for example, what dithering does, it uh, essentially truncates the mantissa in the floating point representation of each entry. So this makes the this makes the vector smaller because typically mantissa is is quite large. Uh, so it doesn't zero out the entries, but it changes the uh, the representation. So it cuts off some. Is it only me or it is frozen? Uh, I okay. Uh, 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 Raffle somehow uh, sorry, is. I think I lost connection. Okay, uh, okay. yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I'll be That's back. That's fine. Okay, so then. Let me reshare. Resume. Resume. Yeah. Right. So, very sorry about that. No, okay, sorry. so I will now briefly discuss uh, the Marina algorithm. Uh, uh just well, let me just double check is the recording still in progress is it oh is it yeah that's uh yeah it's it's in, in progress yeah yeah all right great uh okay so uh maybe what i will do is i will highlight three most important points uh, so in marine what we imagine that gk uh, imagine like let's think about it recursively so imagine that we have a gradient estimate gk and we want to produce a new gradient estimate gk plus one in, for the next iteration. So what happens is that first we make the gradient step. That's, that's, that's so far so good, plain and simple. And then we update uh, GIK. So GIK is kind of like a local component of GK, uh, GK plus one in the following way. So we flip, a bi we flip a bias coin and if it lands heads, we uh, update GIK plus one to the full gradient of FI at XK plus one. So please uh, recall that we, in practice, do not want to send full gradients because that's expensive. But maybe if we do it with low probability, it will be still fine. So we do that with, prob with, some, uh, with some probability. And with other probability, we, uh, what we do is we compute the gradients locally. And then we, uh, take, uh, uh, we, take, uh, we compress the difference between the current gradient and the previous uh, gradient and send it to the uh, master, okay? And then we add, it, we add to it the previous uh, uh, gradient estimate locally. Then the master aggregates uh, the gradient estimates in the following way and sends it back to the workers and the procedure continues. So uh, 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 attentive listener will spot that actually something interesting is happening here because uh, in Marina, the gradient uh, estimate uh, is biased. Uh, and this is a very, very rare uh, situation of optimization where biased gradient uh, estimator actually helps uh, convergence. Um, right. Uh, I will also mention that uh, the details of Marina and how it works are not, uh, not, very, rel not very important for today's talk. Uh, today's talk is mainly about compression, but what you should know is Marina is that Marina is the current state of the art uh, uh, optimization method for non-convex regime uh, in, the, in, uh, uh, in the distributed setting in terms of communication complexity. And it attains the following rates. So it's, uh, 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 it, it depends on these two constants that I mentioned. So this is the smoothness, con oh, sorry. This is the smoothness constant. And this is this um, constant that is related to the upper bound on the second moment of the smoothness terms. And P is the probability uh, of our biased uh, coin. And, and omega is the omega that I mentioned uh, uh, here in, with these compressors. Um, uh, okay, so we will uh, we claim to have a strict improvement upon that uh, using our new class of compressors. And uh, let me move to our results now. So uh, this is something I've already uh, mentioned. 
so so far, uh, typically it was assumed that the compressors are uh, independent and uh, and unbiased, and we generalized this to something uh, that uh, recovers the uh, the previous uh, compressors as special cases and opens up a door to a whole new field of uh, correlated compressors uh, through so-called uh, AB assumption. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, then we uh, we want to uh, uh, refine the analysis of Marina to extract uh, the possible advantage of using these compressors, and we do that through a, a newly introduced quantity called Hessian variance. So Hessian variance, uh, I will discuss this more in detail, but for now, uh, please mark it as something that uh, measures the similarity between our functions. Uh, and uh, the improvements uh, can be uh, up to square roots of n, uh, where n is the number of uh, uh, workers, and one plus uh, d over square root of n, where, where uh, when n is bigger than d. So uh, please note that this can still be significant because while uh, while n uh, while n can be bigger than d, it, maybe if it's not too big, then it's still uh, asymptotic improvement. So this happens if uh, Hessian variance is small. Uh, if it's uh, if it grows big, uh, then uh, uh, then of course the the improvement diminishes. Uh, and but the important thing is that the previous state of the art trait uh, is recovered, so we do not lose anything by using our new method. And uh, finally, we provide um, two classes of uh, simple experiments that are used uh, to highlight our theory, show the dependencies of practice on uh, our quantities. So we have two types of experiments. We have quadratic optimization and uh, linear autoencoder uh, on MNIST dataset. All right, so let's get started on the contributions. So uh, first quantity that I will discuss is the um, so-called AB inequality. So this is a new assumption on the compressors. So before we co consider the compressors individually, but uh, now we consider them together and uh, notice that here we have, uh, we also estimate the variance, but this is the variance of something else. This is the variance of the actual average uh, of um, compressed vectors, not just not just one vector, but their average. And uh, uh, we say that these compressors satisfy the AB inequality if uh, this variance is upper bounded by A times the second moment minus B times the squared average. Uh, okay, so uh, why why do we have this idea? So for example, notice that uh, if uh, maybe this will come clearer in this slide. So let's assume that uh, this, uh, this inequality is satisfied and uh, AI are equal. And they are, all this, they are all equal to the same vector. Then what happens? Well, if, if AIs are equal, if they are the same, then the second moment is equal to the average. So what happens, uh, and let's further assume that uh, A is equal to B. So if A is equal to B, and AI equals to A, then uh, the right-hand side is equal to zero. And what does it mean? It means that uh, the left-hand side is zero because it has to be non-negative. But this implies that while each CI individually compresses the vector, then uh, uh, even though this, this, is, this, this is true, the average of gradients is still recovered, right? So, so we do not lose actually. So, so now, now if, we, if you replace AIs with gradient of F uh, uh, of FI, then what happens is that if we apply these compressors to the homogeneous setting, if, if all functions are identical, if, if the situation is homogeneous, then the full gradient is recovered. So uh, when the full gradient is recovered, uh, then uh, we, we are just running gradient descent. In, t in terms of uh, iteration uh, complexity. But now we also gain in communication because while uh, we have the same amount of iterations uh, as in gradient descent, we save on communication. So the method is strictly faster. Uh, and we, were, uh, we are hopeful that, okay, of course this is very unrealistic because in usual settings, the functions are not identical. 
Uh, but we still hope that we can extract some, uh, some speed up uh, uh, that depends on the similarity. So are there any questions about this idea? Okay, I don't hear any questions. Uh, so let's, uh, let me move on. Uh, okay. So uh, why can correlation help? Uh, so uh, let's, uh, one can, uh, it's an easy exercise that one can rewrite uh, this uh, right-hand side uh, as, uh, as such. So uh, mm, uh, it's uh, constant A times this convex combination uh, of uh, second moments and uh, ver sample variance, where I, where I define sample variance as this quantity. Okay, and uh, of course, uh, second moment always upper bounds the variance. So intuitively speaking, so let's, let's imagine that we fix A. A is fixed and we, we somehow control B. Uh, then uh, observe that first that B has to be uh, uh, at most A because otherwise uh, we get nonsense when we plug in uh, identical vectors, then the right-hand side is negative. So A is always, uh, if this assumption holds, then A is always greater or equal to B. Uh, okay, so uh, let's say we fix A uh, and control B, then uh, what, what do we want? How do we optimize this term? Well, we optimize it by putting as much weight as possible to this term, because this is bigger or equal to this. And we want this to be as small as possible because we want the, uh, the compression uh, kind of variance to be small. We want, uh, we want to recover as much information about the gradient as possible. So if we set A equal to B, then this term vanishes and we are left with uh, variance. Uh, so we so so that's why uh, this b equals to a case is very special. We are looking for we are looking for compressors that uh, uh, that, that that satisfy this. Also for the point I, I said that uh, you know uh, if we plug in the identical vectors, we recover the iteration complexity of gradient descent while uh, while com while still compressing. So this, this is why uh, this case is very special. So we are, our goal is to find a compressor that satisfies A equals to B. Uh, okay, and now uh, what happens if uh, uh, in the previous, uh, previously known methods, if CI are uncorrelated? Well, uh, I will show now that if CI are, uncorre are co uncorrelated, then actually it's very quite easy to check that B is equal to zero. So uh, it is actually the opposite of what we want. We want B to be as large as possible, but it's zero. So, uh, so it, it's, it's definitely not, uh, this solution is definitely not for us. Doesn't work very well. Uh, okay, so uh, why is that? So uh, let's check that our previous uh, independent unbiased compressors with this omega assumption satisfy A, A, B, A, B uh, inequality with B equals to zero. So how, how do we show that? Uh, let's uh, let's let's take this quantity and let's just expand the brackets. So we get this. We have the second moment uh, of these terms, which is already quite familiar because we can bound it separately, uh, and we get uh, this quantity. Uh, and now we can notice that because we assume that uh, C i and C j are independent for i different than j. Uh, then we can apply set expectation uh, to each compo component wise, right? And uh, if we do that, uh, we can use unbiasedness to notice that the expectation of CI of AI is equal to AI. And similarly for this one, so each of these terms is equal to zero. So we are left with this. And now we just use our omega assumption. Uh, so we bound each of these terms by omega over N times the norm of AI squared. And this is what we're left with. So uh, we have that omega over N e uh, equals A and B is equal to zero. Right. So this is not good. Uh, we, we want A equals to B. Uh, okay. So now I will provide uh, a compressor that uh, satisfies this. 
So first we assume that these uh, bigger or equal to n and uh, assume that uh, n divides d. Uh, in our paper, we devise a more general uh, 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 compressor where this assumption doesn't hold. It's just, uh, it's, uh, but it's, a, it's just a simple extension. And I think this would kind of violate the, uh, the message of, of, of the main message. So for the sake of presentation, I will make this simplifying assumption. If you're interested, you can read up the details in the paper. Um, so uh, what we do in each iteration is we generate uh, a random permutation of set D. And this permutation will encode uh, which coordinates uh, will uh, uh, each device send. So uh, if we do, uh, I will of course illustrate it in the picture. So this will be maybe easier to see. But what happens is that we we divide uh, we divide uh, each uh, the, like the permutation into q equal blocks, and each of these blocks encodes the coordinates that divide uh, a particular device has to send, and then we rescale re re the compressed vectors by the factor of n to preserve unbiasedness. And then it turns out that uh, PermK compressors uh, compressor satisfies this uh, in a, uh, inequality of A equal to B equal to one. So let me now illustrate uh, how this works. So let's assume for sake of simplicity that uh, uh, D is equal to uh, four and N is equal to two. Okay, so what we do is uh, uh, we want to have we generate uh, a random permutation. So let's, for example, take one, three, two, four. And uh, here are our devices. And uh, each of the gradients has dimension two. Uh, sorry, uh, of course, this is four dimensional. So we need two more. Okay, so basically what we do is uh, Q is equal to D over N, which is two. So what we do is we uh, just take, uh, we divide this permutation into two equal sized blocks and this corresponds to device one and this corresponds to device two. So this says that device one has to send coordinate one and three and zero out other entries. And this one, two and four and zero out other entries. And finally, we uh, multiply everything by N to preserve unbiasedness. And N is equal to two, of course. Okay, so uh, any questions at this point? Uh, sorry, Rafael, I didn't quite understand uh, what is it that uh, you, you are doing here. So uh, you have this permutation mm -hmm. and then uh, what are you doing with it? Right. So the permutation, uh, for example, uh, permutation encodes uh, which divide, like which device sends what coordinates, right? Because if, for example, we have independence, then in some, some way there is no coordination between the nodes. And uh, permutation basically ensures that uh, that uh, each uh, like that, that there is some some degree of coordination. So let's imagine that we are at iteration k. Oh, sorry. Let's imagine that we are at iter iteration k, right? So uh, we have some kind of vectors stored at each device, and we want to send the compressed version of these vectors to the master. Okay. So, and the way we do that is okay. Uh, we generate globally a random permutation. Uh, and every let's assume every device knows this permutation, and uh, let, and the de uh, the device one uh, has this permutation and says okay so uh, so I see this permutation and uh, this is my block. Uh, my block uh, is one and three, so it says I have to send coordinates one and three, and then uh, zero out all other entries. And uh, similarly for other devices. So basically, this mm. permutation is an encoding of which coordinates which device sends. Okay. So is, does that clarify? Does that mm -hmm. clarify? Yeah. All right. Great. Uh, so, uh, by the way, please like feel free to interrupt me. This is actually my first talk, uh, so I'm very welcome to any questions. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, right. Uh, I will then move on. Uh, what about the case n bigger or equal to d? uh then 
in this case, actually, we will. Uh, so please note that actually, uh, this the previous case kind of uh, constrains the number of uh, like we cannot we cannot compress arbitrarily small, because uh, like this structure is kind of rigid. We we uh, we require from each devices roughly uh, d over n coordinates, right? So for example, we cannot just send one coordinate. Then uh, this a b inequality be, will be violated. But it turns out that actually this is fine. Uh, and this is actually a very important uh, part of our paper where we prove uh, in the appendix that this is no worse than a round, round K, which was the standard compression for any K uh, floats that are preserved. Uh, so this is, this is uh, even though this is kind of rigid, it, it turns out to be fine, but it, I think it's a point worth making. Okay, so in this case, n bigger than d, things are better because uh, we actually require one coordinate from each device only. So this is like as, the compression is like as small as you can you can imagine. Um, and for the sake of simplicity, we will again assume that uh, d divides n. So uh, uh, this is again like a, we can generalize it to arbitrary uh, n and d, but uh, we will not make it here because this will disturb the presentation. And uh, the way we do that is kind of similar. So uh, we start from, uh, so imagine that actually what we do this time is uh, we create some, um, we have some uh, Q different uh, compressors. Uh, for example, compressor one uh, sparsifies the gradient to coordinate number one, compressor number two sparsifies the gradient to coordinate number two and so on. And then we kind of create a set uh, that includes Q copies of each of these compressors, okay? And then what we do is we just permute uh, these uh, compressors randomly uh, around uh, each device uh, in each iteration. Uh, so this is uh, formally described here. And uh, this D is again, just a rescaling factor to preserve uh, unbiasedness because each coordinate has a probability one over D to be chosen. And uh, I will also illustrate it in the next slide. Uh, and the point is that uh, this compressor also satisfies the AB inequality with uh, this A and B. Uh, also, uh, maybe, you know, just to like maybe enhance the intuition, uh, one can uh, do some reality check uh, on, uh, let, let's say we have imagined, we invented some compressor compression mechanism and we want to find out whether it satisfies the AB inequality with A equals to B. Then what one can do is one can check what happens if uh, all vectors are equal. Uh, if uh, if, if uh, our compressors do not recover this vector, then uh, A cannot be equal to B. By our previous discussion in the homogeneous case, uh, the, the full vector needs to be perfectly recovered because the variance of the average is zero uh, if A is equal to B and all uh, vectors are independent. So uh, we, we are kind of, uh, when we are designing the, the, these compressors, we started from kind of homogeneous um, setting, just putting all vectors together and try to find out some method, some ways to, to recover the perfect vector uh, in the kind of this homogeneous setting. And this is also true for this compressor. And how we do that is, for example, uh, okay, so let's say n is equal to uh, four and d is equal to two. So our situation, sorry, oh, this is too far. So our situation uh, looks like this. And uh, again, uh, according to our formal definition, we have kind of a multi-set that uh, are really uh, identif uh, really kind of encodes the what compressors do we have in our budget, and we basically permute them. So the compressors are either uh, first coordinate or second coordinate, and each occurs two times, exactly two times. So we basically permute the set uh, one, one, two, two. And let's say we get something like this. Two, one, one, two. Okay. And then what? Uh, what? Uh, what? Uh, what does it do? It says, okay, I uh, this uh, this this sparsifies to two, 
this parsifies to one, this parsifies to one, and this parsifies to two, and these uh, coordinates are uh, zeroed out. And we finally multiply everything by the factor of D, which is two. So does it make sense? Is it clear? Uh, yes. So uh, if you explain it once again, so uh, here it's something different. Before in the previous example, you also had n equals to four and d equals to two, right? Uh, before we had uh, the opposite. We had n equals to two and ah, d okay. equals to four. Okay, I see. Yeah, because uh, and the point is that now we are we afford we 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 can allow ourselves to sparsify uh, more. Uh, to one coordinate because we have excess coordinate. uh, of coordinates and for example let's say let's imagine that uh, that all vectors uh, are identical then yeah. like even in principle we can switch off um, two like two of these devices and they, they will not send anything and these two devices uh, for example this device and this device will only send coordinates but mm. we don't do that because for example the the, the vectors might be different uh, right so but yeah so uh we just specify to one coordinate and uh if uh, if we if we uh, if we just average these things out in the homogeneous case when all when all the vectors are identical then we recover fully the the the, the initial vector okay mm -hmm. and this is kind of a hint that a is equal to b and this is indeed the case mm -hmm. so is uh, does that help yeah all right fantastic so uh, let me remind uh, you about the notation uh, that we have. So uh, these are the key quantities. So L minus is just uh, the smoothness uh, constant. And this is just uh, an upper bound for the, uh, for the second moment of the smoothness terms. Uh, and the reminder is that as well, uh, uh, this is a weaker assumption than Li smoothness of individual FIs. Um, and uh, we like, so, so what, what did I say so far? I said that uh, uh, kind of uh, in the homogeneous uh, data setting, when all the vectors are identical, we are in a great shape. Uh, so this kind of hints that maybe we, we should extract some similarity. So may, maybe our improvement will depend on some similarity and maybe we should introduce some similarity metric that, that captures. And uh, Hessian variance uh, is precisely this metric. Uh, and uh, what, 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 uh, what does it say? So basically uh, it's nothing but the variance of the smoothness terms uh, in, in some sense, because um, nabla f of x minus nabla f of y is just the average of these uh, nablas. Um, and what uh, we say that uh, these functions fi satisfy the Hessian variance bound if uh, this quantity is upper bounded by some constant times the norm of x minus y squared. And now why did I put this rem a reminder here? Because uh, this is this is a this is a quite a common misconception. We actually uh, experienced this during our uh, review periods. Uh, our reviewers uh, thought that this is some additional assumption that we make uh, because a lot of optimization papers they just make a lot of assumptions and they all oh, they say oh they, everything works works fine when the, when only these assumptions uh, hold. But what they missed is that this is actually not an assumption if we are happy to believe that these uh, conditions hold, uh, because uh, trivially, uh, if if uh, uh, L plus minus exists is upper and is upper bounded by L plus, and why is that? Uh, well, we can just uh, forget about this term. So this already increases our quantity if we forget about negative uh, term, and this is already upper bounded by L plus times the norm of X minus Y squared, okay? So we know that there exists a constant for which uh, this quantity is upper bounded by, uh, by this, okay? But if we add, like, uh, add this, term, this negative term back, it can be in practice smaller. Uh, so let's, let's, let's come back. So, so, so under, the, under these, uh, 
uh, admitted quite mild assumptions that I have just described, Hessian variance bound holds for some constant L plus minus. And uh, in, practi in practice, it can be smaller than L plus. Uh, so there are two kind of maybe main example where, where when it is zero. Uh, so uh, it is zero when all functions are equal, uh, of course, because uh, because the average, if, if nabla fi equals to nabla f, then uh, this average is equal to uh, nabla f of x minus nabla f of y squared. And this is uh, the whole right hand side is equal to zero. So, uh, so we can take L plus minus equals to zero. And uh, a quite similar example is when uh, we start from uh, uh, the, same, uh, the same function and then add to each some uh, affine perturbation. Then what happens is that if we compute the gradient of this, then we have nabla, uh, nabla phi of x uh, minus uh, plus, na, plus ai. And then those ais will cancel here in each of these terms. So we will also obtain zero. And uh, note, please note that this uh, problem is, uh, is difficult for, uh, uh, like, uh, for, uh, for the previous methods. They, they, it's not so easy to kind of uh, do the, uh, without, without these compression mechanisms, this, this, this problem is not, not easy to solve. And with our methods, it is solved with iteration complexity of gradient descent. Uh, Okay, uh, so let's get to the results. So uh, I will just say that um, if we introduce this uh, Hessian variance quantity to our analysis, uh, oh, sorry, uh, something, uh, something showed up on my screen that I don't want. Uh, uh, please bear with me. Some application has opened. Sorry about that. Uh, Okay, I should be back. Is it everything fine? Okay. Yep. Uh, right. So uh, I was saying that uh, uh, this uh, this quantity is uh, uh, is used in to refine the analysis of the Marina algorithm, and uh, we it, it's crucial to combine it with this uh, AB inequality that I have um, that I have um, uh, described. So it is uh, not an, it's, it's not a hard uh, modification of the already existing proof. And uh, when we do that, uh, then we obtain the new uh, uh, communication uh, uh, the, the new communication complexity, new improved communication complexity. So here uh, first let's start with iteration complexity. So the number of iterations needed to solve, this uh, gradient minimization problem. So uh, this is the previous rate. Um, uh, I will discuss this uh, entry over the table later, but let's maybe focus uh, now on these two. So uh, previously, we only had dependency on L plus, which was, which was uh, always bigger than L plus minus, right? But here, we have something uh, uh, something uh, like L plus, and then we also have L plus minus. And uh, note uh, what happens if A is equal to B, then this term is gone and we can pull out uh, L plus minus uh, out of this uh, square root. So we have something like A times one minus P over P uh, times L plus minus. And we hope that, uh, and uh, this is already less uh, than uh, than what's, what, what we have here. And if, uh, uh, if, if in fact, uh, imagine, we imagine that L plus minus is equal to uh, uh, zero, uh, then uh, this whole term is gone. And we obtain the iteration complexity of uh, gradient descent. This is, this is the iteration complexity of gradient descent and it's optimal. Uh, and we, we hope that if, if L plus minus is small, then, uh, then uh, we, we are also in a good shape. Uh, okay. And now what about this uh, entry? So uh, in our table, uh, we, in, our, in our paper, we also compared our method to um, also a newly designed method of uh, uh, Richtarik and co-authors, which is called EF21. And it stands for Error, Error Feedback 2021. And uh, Error Feedback is a, uh, is a, is a kind of uh, class of techniques 
uh, that's uh, so. So let's imagine that in distribute we, we run a distributed uh, gradient descent, and instead of unbiased uh, compressors, we used uh, biased ones. And uh, it has been shown by Beznosikov and uh, and uh, and the co-authors that such methods can in fact uh, diverge exponentially. Uh, but uh, and error feedback is uh, our, our techniques to remedy this. And uh, EF21 is the current state of the art uh, uh, mechanism to, uh, that, that guarantees the convergence under uh, bias uh, compression operators. Um, however, it has some issues and uh, there are two main issues with it. So first of all, even though this is uh, a breakthrough result and I actually really encourage everyone to read uh, the EF21 paper, uh, uh, the, even though even though this is this is a regular result, uh, the communication complexity of EF twenty one that was proved in the paper is uh, no better than a gradient descent in theory. So it's uh, uh, so so in theory, um, doing just uh, distributed gradient descent without uh, any 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 compression uh, is uh, is just as good as doing EF twenty one. Uh, however, of course, this is uh, this could potentially, and it seems that way. Uh, it is, this is potentially a weakness of the theory, not uh, not the method, because this method is actually used and um, it, it works well in practice. However, there is another issue with if with error feedback that is not uh, actually a weakness of the theory. It's a it's a weakness of method, and the weakness is that this method does not improve with n. So if n is very big. Then uh, actually the, pre the, the the unbiased compressors, uh, in in particular our compressor, work better. Uh, they they have better theory and they have better practice. Uh, uh, so uh, so so, uh, but still we thought that it's meaningful to compare these methods because they, they solve the same problem. Okay, um, right. So uh, here's the here's the table for communication complexity. Um, and uh, we have, uh, like, again, I ask you, so, so for EF21, this is not very interesting. This is just uh, distributed gradient descent, uh, right? Because uh, the way to see this is that in distributed gradient descent, uh, each, um, each device sends full gradients. So we have D floats, uh, right? Uh, and the number of iterations is uh, delta zero over epsilon times L minus times D. So this is the communication complexity, which is the total number of bits sent in, in the whole uh, procedure. Um, can I ask a, sure. a question, Rafael? So um, uh, previously you showed the number of communication rounds, right? So in the previous table. Yes, yes. Was it? Uh, and uh, so uh, here you are discussing communication complexity. Yes. What do you mean by communication complexity? Right. So just as a reminder, communication complexity is the number of communication rounds times the uh, average number of bits or floats mm -hmm. sent by each worker. Mm -hmm. So we also th this is actually this is actually what we are fighting for, not the iteration mm -hmm. complexity, because you know iteration complexity is, is optimal for gradient descent. So if we don't care about communication, we can just run gradient descent. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but we care about uh, the number of iterations times the number of bits sent by each uh, worker. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so that's so so my point is that for EF twenty one, it's uh, the, this is this is the number of iterations in gradient descent, and this is the number of floats that we send uh, by each worker. So it's so this is like this is so it's it's just as good as gradient descent in theory, of course, because in practice it works very well. Uh, okay, um, uh, let's 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 uh, let's move on to the compare. So so theoretically, currently, uh, Marina with uh, perm k is superior to f twenty one. Um, so let's move on to these terms. So again, we have uh, we have uh, the new quantities. So please compare this and entry in this table. Uh, this entry. So we have quantities uh, here. We have the, the over square root of n is multiplied by l plus. And here, uh, d over n, we have d over n times l, l minus plus uh, this uh, d over square root of n times this constant l plus minus, which is smaller than l plus. So again, this is uh, this is an improvement. And uh, if uh, if l plus minus is very small, then in fact this is an asymptotic improvement. 
because Wait, uh, but you also have d by n l minus so mm, it's not exactly yes. d by square root of n l plus minus but it's also this uh, d divided by n l minus right yes but, but uh, um, uh, d over square root of n is yeah, dominant it's a, a d over n okay i see i see yeah 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 uh, uh, but uh, and the point is that uh, so yeah so 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 uh, the point is that if uh, uh, well first of all l plus minus is always smaller than l plus uh, so it's it's dominate so this term is and d over square root of n dominates d over n right but if d over square if l plus minus is very small let's for example assume the, it's zero then this is gone uh, and l plus is equal to l minus it's not 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 difficult to see. Uh, it's not difficult to check that if if l prime l plus minus is zero then l plus is equal to l minus mm -hmm. and then we have an improvement of square root of n uh, okay. and uh, similarly uh, in in this case we have the improvement of one plus d over square root of n and this is uh, summarized uh, in in the following slide so uh, so so this is uh, so if uh, so this, this is like simplify for the sake of simplicity if l plus minus is zero then l plus uh, is equal to l minus and uh, these are the rates for marina with rand k which is the previous standard and marina with our method which is perm k so we have square root of n improvement uh, and uh, if n is bigger than d then we have uh, this extra uh, factor one plus d over square root of n with rand k and with uh, ah this should be this should be perm k with perm k this uh, this factor is gone so we we again obtain uh, this so we have one plus d over square root of n uh, improvement and uh, if uh, if they are not so uh, if they are not so uh, not so small these quantities then we opt we we come back to our previous rate so we do not lose anything and uh, please note that um, even though in rand k we are very flexible in choosing the k uh, we for no choice of k is this method better than perm k which is more rigid uh, asymptotically. So even though here we have more com more flexibility, this this flexibility does not uh, provide us any extra advantage, and we prove this in our paper. Okay, so let me let me briefly discuss the experiments. So in our experiments, we we have, as I mentioned, two types of experiments. We have uh, quadratic optimization, so we uh, we minimize uh, quadratic uh, function. And uh, the, the way the reason we did that is because we can very easily control the, the all the quantities and they are actually uh, kind of we can actually compute them explicitly. And uh, this uh, beautifully shows uh, the dependencies that we discussed because uh, if L plus minus is zero, then this means our data is homogeneous. And uh, here, uh, so here uh, in the y axis, we have the number of nodes. So if the number of nodes is um, small, then kind of we, there is no distinction. But if the number of nodes is, uh, grows bigger, then our, our method, which is the green line, uh, really shines. Uh, and it beats uh, all the methods we compare, uh, we compare to. And uh, once, we, once we progressively increase, uh, uh, increase the, uh, the, homogen the heterogeneity, the improvements degrade, but they are still uh, they are still quite uh, quite significant. Um, so, uh, mm, uh, and the next uh, type of experiment is we train the autoencoder uh, on the MNIST uh, dataset. So this is this was a simple linear uh, linear autoencoder, and uh, the p parameter is simply the control of the uh, homogeneity. Uh, so uh, well, the, the the way we conducted this experiment is is we uh, uh, divide uh, partitioned our data set into some number of copies, and uh, and then uh, with probability uh, and and what we made one copy very special, and uh, with probability p we assigned this special copy to each to 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 a device, and with probability one minus p we assigned uh, some other copy, uh, one of the n other copies. So uh, 
uh, if P is one, then of course all the devices have the same copy. And again, in the homogeneous uh, setting, uh, the, uh, the improvements are dramatic. Uh, if not, then uh, this is actually, I think, more interesting because there is some, uh, if, if, if the split is truly random, then uh, kind of, uh, it seems that our method exploits the inherent uh, homogeneity of the data. Right, because MNIS data set is quite similar because those are just handwritten digits. Uh, so uh, there is some inherent, like that they are they are in some sense similar uh, regardless of how we partition our data. And uh, it's uh, our uh, methods uh, can still exploit such uh, phenomena and produce the improvements. Uh, okay, so I think this concludes my talk. Thank you very much. And I will be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Rafael. I think 